many, many people talked about mind wandering. You know, when you ask people why do you find it hard to do certain things or keep focus? Oh, well, my mind's on the go all the time and I can't focus on anything. So that's kind of really where I, I got into this. And then I'd sort of thought about it and, th and then um, eventually I got around to Googling or, or in the scientific literature you can go into PubMed and I put in mind wandering. Um, and then I was quite surprised to discover there was quite a sophisticated neuroscience of the mind wandering and the wandering mind and the way our brain regulates and controls mind wandering in all of us. Um, and even it was describing different types of mind wandering and this literature seemed very relevant to ADHD and um, so that's where this kind of idea came from. So what I'm going to do today, um, I just thought I'd just briefly, I put these up at, uh, at talks. Um, I don't personally take any payments from anybody but um, if, I'm, if I do work for commercial companies all the money goes to King's College and we use it for research so I don't personally have a problem with that. I'm going to talk about mind wandering and, and just how people describe it um, and then, I'm, then it gets a little bit technical but I will try and not be over technical in, in thinking about the neural correlates of mind wandering both in people with and people without ADHD and then think a little bit about the implications for understanding ADHD. And I think, I think we can learn a lot, I mean, from adults with ADHD and, and, and older children by asking them a lot more about their own experiences. And, and so this is also going to be very relevant to younger children as well. Um, so if you go right back to the DSM and it says, well, what is ADHD? They define it using, uh, they have this introductory sentence where they say it's a persistent pattern of inattention, um, and or hyperactivity impulsivity that interferes with or reduces the quality of functioning in daily life. Um, so that's what we kind of think of as the core symptoms of ADHD, the inattention, the hyperactivity and the impulsivity. And um, then when you actually look at what, what those things mean, I mean these are the symptoms taken out from the DSM, this is how they're currently defining ADHD and kind of this is where I thought um, you know these are still quite behavioral um, they're asking you more about your function in daily life like do you make mistakes when you're doing things how long can you keep your focus uh, do you are you not listening to people you know or you appear not to be listening to people um, do you find it hard to finish tasks or are you very disorganized do you try and avoid things where you're going to have to focus? Um, are you easily distracted? Do you lose things? Are you forgetful? So these are the sort of inattentive symptoms. And then the hyperactivity is kind of being fidgety, restless, finding it hard to sit still for long, being on the go all the time. And the impulsivity, I suppose to me the, one of the key ones here is impatience, hating to wait, you know, thinking about waiting, kind of getting really irritable. Um, um, but I was always asking people, you know, why, you know, if you don't finish things off, why don't you finish th things off? You know, if you are forgetful, you know, why are you forgetful? Why aren't you listening to people? What's actually going on in your head that prevents you or makes it harder for you to do those things? Um, and the other thing I thought is that, you know, because a lot of psychiatrists or psychologists sort of say, well, ADHD symptoms are very non-specific. you know, don't they occur in all conditions? And, uh, you know, a concentration problem, being a bit distractible. I mean, you also get that if you're anxious or depressed. Um, I actually think that isn't necessarily true when you take the whole cluster. I mean, the DSM criteria actually seem to work reasonably well. Um, perhaps surprisingly, in my view, but they actually do work quite well. I mean, there's lots of empirical data showing that it's really predictive of treatment responses and outcome and genetics and a whole range of different things. But I think there are ways that, that when I think how do I diagnose somebody with ADHD, I'm often also focusing on other things that aren't actually in the DSM. And one of them is this ability to hyperfocus, which is a very classical sort of ADHD thing where you 
you, it's kind of like an all or none thing. You can either not focus at all or you hyper focus, but there's no kind of balance in between. So it's more about the control and regulation. It's not really a, an attention deficit. And of course, that can be very confusing to people who think that, yeah, if you've got ADHD, you can never concentrate on things. So when you can concentrate on things you like doing, people think you don't have ADHD. Um, but, it, but in a way, it's, it, it almost helps you make the diagnosis. And I suppose a lot of people, I do a lot of work in prisons, and I may get onto that later if, if we have time. Um, but lots of people describe their problem as they get bored quick. You know, once you're bored, you can't focus, and then your mind's kind of wandering. And so this is a sort of very sort of typical uh, description that people give. And, and although I'm not going to talk about this today, I do think impatience when, when waiting is such a key symptom of ADHD. And I sort of notice that when even if you ask people to think about waiting in a queue, they get this kind of oh, kind of thing. It's quite characteristic. So certainly that's a key. And I, I suppose that underpinned, um, you know, I know Edmund Sanuga Barks talked here and he would have talked probably about delay aversion, but it, that's what he's getting at. This sort of feeling when you're having to wait. But the other very characteristic feature is this kind of type of mind wandering that people have. Um, and that seems to be very, again, very characteristic of ADHD. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course, when we make the diagnosis, we do have to explain to people that it's not just about symptoms. We're talking about symptoms where they're causing a problem. And, and although people tend to focus more on the kind of functional or kind of social problems, like it makes it harder for you in your work or in your education, maybe it's affecting the way you relate to people socially. You know, when it's severe, just doing really simple everyday things can be prob problematic. People have more accidents if they have ADHD, there's more risk-taking behavior. But, um, but even in the absence of those functional problems, a lot of people with ADHD will nevertheless experience ADHD as more of a kind of mental health problem. They'll be distressed by some of the symptoms, like being feeling restless all the time, um, having your mind constantly on the go, not being able to sleep is a big part of a big problem in ADHD, getting very irritable often, um, having a kind of low self-esteem. So all of these are problems in ADHD, even in the absence of functional impairments. And I think that's often not well understood either. Um, but of course, you do also meet people with ADHD who are doing really well in life. And it's a kind of interesting question. A lot of people say, well, you know, can ADHD actually be a gift? You know, does it actually help you and enable you to do certain tasks better? And I think it's, um, there's not a lot of empirical data on this. I mean, we know there are people with ADHD who are really successful and maybe mind wandering is part of that if they're very creative you know get a lot of comedians a lot of people in the arts are quite um, and you know maybe they are very creative if their mind is constantly spinning off new ideas and at least some people have the ability to grasp that and kind of go with it um, but they may be the people that buck the trend I mean currently there's no evidence that um, a certain level of ADHD is a benefit overall but I think it's still an open question. But certainly in terms of empirical data, um, this is a population survey, and, and so it's not just the clinical group, but looking more generally, if you measure ADHD symptoms of inattention, for example, it has a very linear relationship with the measures of impairment. So in general, as far as we know, the more inattention you have, the more likely you are to have impairment in various domains and similarly for the hyperactive impulsive symptoms but of course these are just trends and it doesn't mean that people with ADHD can't do really well as well so it's a kind of question we're interested to know whether there might whether there could be certain areas where it's a positive advantage but it's not been clearly demonstrated as yet so behind a lot of this is this idea of mind wandering so if you say, well, how is mind wandering defined? Um, it's off, it occurs when one's mind drifts away from a task and focuses on internal thoughts and images that are unrelated to things you're trying to do. 
Um, it's something we all do, and we probably do it at least half the time. So it's a completely normal thing that we all do. But nevertheless, it can be very different in different people. And when you talk to people with ADHD, they often use certain terms to describe their particular type of mind wandering. They might say they're constantly daydreaming or their mind's kind of in a fog because they can't focus on one thing at a time. Like a whirlwind of thoughts, a million thoughts at the same time. Thoughts like a hamster on a wheel or popping up like a jack-in-the-box. Popping corn, somebody said, like fireworks in my head, waves in a storm. So there's many different ways that people describe it. And um, then the other thing is people are also quite good at drawing pictures of it. And so these are uh, a, a certain pictures we've collected over the years. Um, I really like this one, the kind of spaghetti head. So it's like a sort of a jumble and there are all these different thoughts and, and they're all going on at the same time. So it's all very jumbled up. It's hard to focus on one thing at a time. And I, I really like this one where you've got nine different um, knobs they're all on full volume, all at the same time. And the person says people with ADHD often struggle with filtering out. So you've got sort of multiple different thoughts all going on at the same time, and it's all at full volume, and you can't control it. Um, here's another one. What the hell is that? <laughs> oh, that's just my mind. And there's a sort of constant rapid thought flow. Um, some people quite like their mind, you know, this kind of thing. My mind is a lot more interesting than real life, and not everyone likes medication because it kind of reduces that. Um, some people are really distressed, and, and this is where it kind of overlaps into other conditions as well, like, like um, borderline personality. And this person, you know, this is how they picture the thoughts in their head. The Mad Hatter said, have I gone mad? Yes, I'm afraid you're entirely bonkers. Um, so it can be really distressing. It was very distressing for this particular person. Um, I did have a video, but it doesn't work. But what he describes, um, he says it's like, for him, it's like a cacophony of ideas. Layers and layers of this going on. Internal dialogue constantly going on, and I can't stop it. I'm distracted by what's going on in my head and my mind's so active, that's the other part of it, um, I don't want to go to bed. That typically happens at the same time. So we thought about um, all these descriptions that people were giving and we decided that there were probably three main components to what people were describing. They were describing that their thoughts were just constantly on the go, they never switched off. They they describe their thoughts jumping and flitting from one thing to another, not being focused on one thing at a time. And also, they weren't thinking about one thing, but lots of different things. And there wasn't really anything um, unusual or abnormal about the content of what they were thinking. So it was quite different from depressive ruminations, for example. I mean, they were just whatever is normal for that person. So they could be worrying about real problems in their life. Um, um, or they could be, or, but they could just be ordinary everyday things, but it's whatever was normal for that person. And so we made a rating scale um, called the excessive, uh, the mind excessively wandering scale or MUSE. And what you'll see if, if you look down is, is we're, we're only asking about um, the flow of thoughts in your head and this experience of this kind of ceaseless, unfocused mental activity. There's nothing here about the content or even the effect it has on you. So it's kind of interesting, it's just asking about the experience of your mind wandering. And then when we um, asked people with ADHD, these blue bars, and people without ADHD, the red bars, and we measured this mind wandering measure, you'll see that the people with ADHD scored themselves much, much higher than the non-ADHD group on this mind-wandering measure. And these are just showing, these, these are measures of how big those differences were. And in fact, the differences were very similar to measuring ADHD itself. So these are the traditional inattentive measures of ADHD. These are the traditional hyperactive impulsive measures. And actually this is emotion dysregulation because that's also something that people with ADHD experience that people with ADHD don't. 
Um, but essentially mind wandering in itself was really predictive of having ADHD. And this data here, um, what it's showing is that the um, correlation in the whole, in, in a and a, and a kind of broader sample of people with and without ADHD. And it's sort of showing that our mind-wandering measure correlates very highly with all the ADHD symptoms, including inattention, hyperactivity, emotion, dysregulation, and also impairment in daily life. So it's very predictive of all the things we think of as ADHD. And the red bars are actually showing that even if you measure these things two months, six months apart, that if your ADHD symptoms change, if they go up or down, um, your mind wandering goes up and down at the same time. So they kind of track each other. So it suggests that mind wandering is a kind of fundamental part of ADHD. When I first showed this data in my institute, they said, well, it's all very well, but isn't mind wandering just inattention and so what, what's the point in measuring it and so at least it led us to ask the question what about its prediction on function and impairment in daily life and what this is showing is that if you what we're predicting here is um, people's ratings of their difficulty in daily life their problems in their daily life and um, so the, the traditional ADHD measures do predict problems in daily life but if you add in our mind wandering measure, it actually sort of adds to the prediction. And if you put them in all together, what you'll see is that mind wandering here is the strongest predictor of problems in daily life. It's actually a better predictor than the traditional inattentive symptoms or the hyperactivity symptoms in this particular adult population. So it seemed to have a kind of key predictive role in real problems in real life. So why might that be? And I suppose you just have to think through, you know, if you're experiencing this type of uncontrolled mind wandering, it makes it very hard to do things. And if you're, and many of those things are what we call ADHD. So if you're trying to follow a conversation, but your mind's constantly drifting off, you're not really listening. And then you're, you know, so you appear not to be listening. If you're reading pages on a book, but again, if your mind's elsewhere, it's constantly wandering off and you can't control it, you're missing, you're not reading it properly, and then you're missing what you've just read. Um, it's hard to sustain your attention in that way. It's also very hard to hold thoughts in mind, and that's essentially what people call working memory, being able to sort of manipulate sums or ideas, sort of think through, you know, plan ahead. But if your mind's constantly elsewhere, you can't, and it's also not focused. So it's very unfocused. It's not a very useful kind of mind wandering. So it makes it hard to hold thoughts in mind and to think strategically. And I think a lot of people get exhausted, you know, the experience of having your mind constantly on the go. And then when you want to do things, you've got to kind of suppress it in some way and focus. But that's quite hard work. It takes a lot of energy. And people with ADHD often feel fatigued because of it. And I suppose the other part is they're often fatigued because they haven't slept very well. But when you ask people, why can't you get off to sleep? They'll say, well, I'm physically and mentally so restless that I just can't get to sleep. My mind's completely overactive and it won't let me get to sleep. So it seems to be a big part of the reason why people with ADHD have problems sleeping. So that's kind of how we kind of think or how I think of mind wandering in relation to ADHD. But then when I started looking in the literature, um, of course people said, well, there are different types of mind wandering. And actually, if you're driving your car and you're thinking about what you're going to cook for dinner, I mean, you are focused and you're being quite, um, it's quite useful. And it's actually something we have to do to problem solve, to think ahead, to, to manage our lives. And, and what they noticed is that you could actually, um, they define these two different types of mind wandering. There's a kind of very deliberate sort of focused type of mind wandering. Uh, but there's also this spontaneous uncontrolled type. And what these um, graphs are showing is that it's the spontaneous uncontrolled type that relates to ADHD. That's what this is showing. Whereas the kind of deliberate kind of focus type has nothing to do with ADHD. Um, so this was a very interesting uh, paper on that. And so you can imagine there are these different things going on, that sometimes your mind is focused on 
on a particular thought or activity. Um, sometimes your thoughts get hijacked. Um, I mean, it could be that you've been upset by something or you're feeling depressed. And so your mind is kind of turning to these sort of negative experiences, for example. So that is a type of mind wandering. Or it might be that your mind just wanders aimlessly all over the place. And we think that this is the kind of ADHD type of mind wandering. I have to thank um, Kai, who's an artist I work with, who's been making these um, pictures. And that's her depiction of herself, actually. Um, sort of running. She loves running. And these are that's what her mind's like. So. Um, and in fact, then when you go more into the literature, it turns out that um, there are quite sophisticated theoretical models on this. Um, and in this particular paper, which is in, um, it's like a Nature Reviews article, they talk about one dimension, which is really going from being focused and controlled at one end to being completely unfocused at the other end. And this is more to do with um, the content of your thoughts. So if you're depressed or you've got obsessive ruminations, it's like very constrained on a particular problem. But, or it could be a kind of more sort of unconstrained sort of daydreaming kind of wandering state. And so ADHD we think is here. So there, there's very little constraint on their minds wandering a lot, but also the content is not on anything in particular. Whereas if you've depressed, if you've got depressed or some other type of problem, it's slightly different. So it's kind of interesting that there is a relationship. And if we understand the processes underlying these things better, it could explain why somebody with ADHD over at risk is at risk of becoming depressed. You know, if you're traumatized or something bad happens to you and your mind's wandering in this way, it could easily push you into this sort of domain. We're, one thing we're doing or what I'm doing is um, we have another interview called the scan and I've written a kind of glossary definition of what all the ADHD symptoms kind of really look like and so when for example I talk about sustained attention problems that's that's where I kind of say yeah but it's 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 rela relative to what you're doing and so actually it's it's uh, it's more specific if you get this kind of hyper focus on the things you really enjoy or really like doing but as soon as you lose interest in it then you can't focus at all and it's this kind of all or none thing so I think so we're trying to get these descriptions sort of into the literature and then hopefully they will influence people and then and then when they want to talk about something there is a need to talk and not stop Right. Because, because yeah. it seems that if they stop, yeah. then they lose track. And it's a bit like the diagram yeah. you drew on as that sort of mental hijack. And that mm. I, I can keep on this thought, I'm fine. But if I go off that thought, yeah. I'm back into my... Yeah, so if you ask, because one of the ADHD symptoms, is, it's actually impulsivity item, isn't it? It's like, yeah. um, tend to interrupt people. But that's that, that can be due to inattention, not, it's not necessarily hyperactivity. So people often say, well, there's several reasons they give. One is they just are talking all the time. That, so sometimes it is a kind of bit of a hyperactivity thing, but it isn't always. Some people say, well, if because I, I can't stop to focus and listen on what get, they're going to say, there's actually no point. Mm -hmm. So I'll just continue with my point, because even if I stop to listen, I'm not going to hear them anyway. And the other reason is what you're saying is you'll forget what you were about to say. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't get it out now, then by the time I take my turn in the conversation, I'll have forgotten what I was going to say, so I'd better say it now or I'll forget. That's what they seem yeah. to describe. So that is quite a, um, a common description. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, yeah, and so your mind is being hijacked by your own thoughts, yeah. you know, and then you lose track of the thought that you had. Exactly. So you've got it at that point in time, but by the time you get to something, yeah. So I think it does underpin that. Yeah, yeah I completely agree, yeah. Is it quite normal for people with ADHD to want to talk about themselves a lot? I mean, people with autism, I always think they kind of certain, have certain things that they think about and then they, they fixate on them. And so regardless of what, what situation, they'll just always talk about the same thing. So they keep coming back to this, like a sort of bee in the bonnet that you can't move on from. And ADHD isn't like that because it's sort of, it could be one thing or another thing, you know, or the, 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 the last thing that happened to you that you're talking about. 
I mean, whether some people just because they're talking a lot and then people naturally talk about themselves, but I have to say it's not, it's not something I've particularly noticed. People do have very um, different sort of types of mind wandering, and for some people, you know, it, it comes quite naturally to think about one thing and to be more focused on one thing at a time. And for other people, that doesn't come naturally, and then their minds sort of thinking about lots of other things. But I mean, but it is a a trait in the population so in a way you get all different levels from one extreme to the other and I suppose when we think of ADHD you could argue it's not a disorder because everyone has some level of it it's like saying you know what is blood pressure we all have a blood pressure but we still worry about it when it's too high and when it's very high of course it can be really damaging so I think I think um, you know we do have to think of ADHD in that way it's a sort of dimensional so within families of course whether you have ADHD or not you, you're more likely to have traits of ADHD and aspects of it you may well have more ADHD than somebody who doesn't have a relative with ADHD so I know for, um, especially um, comedians always st st stand up in my mind but also musicians who can sort of um, who use this sort of mind wandering in their comedy so ideas just pop into their head and they blurt them out but it can be they've tailored it in this way and if they go on medication it can help them do things like sit down write a book which some, a lot of them are writers as well and they find it really hard to write a book because they can't keep focused but then when they're on stage they don't want their medication and so they can sort of tailor the way they're focused depending on the tasks that they're doing it, where it tips into ADHD is where you have less control or it's harder to control it or you can only control it when you're doing something that's really motivating because that keeps you focused but as soon as it kind of loses that kind of motivational feeling then you just can't focus and so yeah but being able to control it being able to focus when you want to is kind of in a way that uh, that could be at the heart of the problem that you kind of lose that ability to choose when when to focus and when not to focus um, but in ADHD it is true then they also get easily distracted so if there's a noise or a sound um, they might get easily distracted but then if they're hyper focused then in a way they're sort of like with blinkers on and then they may not even notice things so it depends what state they're in I suppose one difference is it's much more kind of malleable in ADHD. It's much more dependent on the task and the activity yeah. behind it, whereas AD autism is kind of more like a fixed trait. It doesn't really, it doesn't change much. I mean, obviously you could simplify the environment so they're not overload. Uh, but I think it is fundamentally different. And in fact, the more um, there is quite a lot of research now looking at cognitive functions, and they. If, you're, if you carefully discriminate ADHD from autism on clinical grounds, on descriptive grounds, you do seem to get good separation of cognitive and other types of measures. So I think, so I view them, although they can co-occur, yeah. because there's some sort of shared developmental origin, I mean for example there's lots of shared gene effects, but at the same time I think they are distinctive. But it can lead to confusion if somebody's inattentive could it be the inattention of ADHD or the inattention of autism? And so I have to, I don't have any data on the type of mind wandering I'm talking about in autism, but we do have a new sample we'll be looking at, we hope to look at shortly. Because my view is they probably would have a much more focused kind of, um, they may have internal thoughts, but they would be quite different. They probably don't, my guess is they don't jump and flit in the same way. I don't, I'm not sure, to be honest, but I think they, they, they are qualitatively different, and whether our measures can capture those differences. Because if your mind's on the go all the time, and then, and then um, something bad's happened to you, you're going to be thinking about it, so you're, in a way you're exposing yourself, because you can't control your thoughts. You are exposing yourself to more of these worrying thoughts. I mean, they may not be excessively... You may not be worrying more than is appropriate, but you, you just can't control the amount of thinking. And so that in itself can make you more anxious because your mind's just constantly churning up these thoughts. I've had really, um, I learnt a lot more about this in working in the prison where you get a lot of people with a kind of, um, well, trauma-based syndromes, I'd call them. But I mean, you could say some of them have post-traumatic stress disorder, but they've also got ADHD. And so when you 
treat them for ADHD, because their mind wandering becomes more controlled, they're exposing themselves to less of these traumatic memories and thoughts. And so during the day, when they can actually focus on things, they find they're feeling a lot better and their mind isn't constantly churning up these kind of like um, you know, nightmares in the middle of the day. And so they, some of them say at night time, when it's all quiet, then they start thinking again about these things. But it really reduces the amount of negative thoughts and they're feeling so much better as a result. So it's quite interesting, the interaction between ADHD and other kind of problems. I mean, I think this whole area of ADHD, dyslexia and dyspraxia is really unclear. To me, it's really unclear. And certainly it does seem like different professions will put people in, you know, somebody who, who's trained as an as a educational assessor, for example, will often say somebody's got dyslexia or dyspraxia. But then when you look at what they're describing, I would call it ADHD. But then they think that's a medical diagnosis and not something they can do or even have the skills or the ability to do. So you, So different people call it different things. So I think... I mean, I think, of course, having you might have a specific um, difficulty reading, but but it could also be because you're not focused, you can't focus, and that can also cause you not to read as well. So you've got to say so it could be ADHD or, or dyslexia. You have to look at it really carefully. But I think if you've got dyslexia in your mind wandering, and, and so in a way the mind wandering is making you inattentive, this is related to ADHD. So it could be where somebody with ADHD looks as if they have a specific learning difficulty, but it could actually be ADHD that's making it hard for you to have, you know, that's causing a specific learning difficulty. Is that the of yeah. Functions? And that would be the same kind of argument. And within dyspraxia, they're always saying people with dyspraxia have executive function problems, but they're the problems people with ADHD have, like timekeeping, forgetfulness, organisation. You, you know. Such a crossover yeah, thing. absolutely. So I think my, 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 my approach, and particularly if it's severe and causing a problem, of course, is you, sh you should have a formal assessment for ADHD because uh, particularly if you're potentially thinking that a medical treatment could be useful because it's so severe that it really would, you know, there'd be value in that. Um, I mean, I suppose a lot of the ways that people try and support people with this dyslexia and dyspraxia could be very helpful, even if it's due to ADHD. Um, so it depends, you know, if you're thinking, but I think often what people are calling, you know, for exactly the reasons you're saying, absolutely. So it's, it seems very confusing, this whole area. Uh, it's less well defined than people think, and it does seem that different professions, you know, they're, they're homed in on their diagnosis, and it's the same the other way around within our clinic. I said to the psychologists, um, why don't you evaluate people for dyslexia? Because half of people with ADHD have dyslexia. And they said, oh, it's not what we're trained to do. And I thought, well, that's really silly. Cause that's like <laughs> and so it, it works both ways. So there are these sort of boundaries, professional boundaries that shouldn't really be there, that don't help. I think, and often, I mean, I think there are different diagnostic approaches that people take. And so for dyslexia and dyspraxia, they're often expecting and looking for a working memory impairment. And in fact, what we found is you're more likely to get help, even if it's mainly ADHD. If you've, you also do poorly on a working memory test, because then people, they kind of, oh, we're happy with that, because we can see there's a problem on this working memory test. And then, but the problem can be if you, if you actually perform well on a working memory test, which some people with ADHD do, and some people with ADHD don't. So these are kind of almost like um, neurodevelopmental comorbidities, you could think. And, um, you know, we know there's this sort of general pool of genes that affect neurodevelopment, and you can get all these different pictures. And things like working memory, to me, they're just one, um, let's say you've actually got a working memory just at the neural level, as well as the performance level. Uh, but that may just be one, uh, one aspect of a, new, of a basic neurodevelopmental problem. And it, they may not necessarily be causing the other thing, they're just associated with the other thing. So in the same way you get ADHD, okay, and then sometimes you get autism, sometimes you get working memory deficits, sometimes you get dyslexia. So they're all things that often co-occur together. 
but I think people make the mistake of then assuming because it's something to do with the brain and we think of working memory as a cognitive function, it must be causing these behavioural problems. And I think that's potentially a mistake. But I know the literature, you know, I mean, in a way, I'm, we're going, I'm talking a little against some of the literature in that area, so I understand that, yeah. And um, people haven't really focused on the, um, the functions that underpin mind wandering, which I think, you know, can lead to a lot of these difficulties. Um, and um, in this slide here, it's kind of showing some of the main parts of the brain. And the central executive, for example, is, is um, the main uh, executive control region, and that's where working memory and also things like um, inhibitory control um, are often thought of as executive functions. So that's the kind of front part of the brain, the frontoparietal networks and other regions. And then on the other hand, you've got this thing called the default mode. And the default mode, um, people didn't know about this until they started doing um, brain scans on people who were just lying there resting. And what they found is that this particular neural network was very active when you were doing nothing. So you were just resting. And they were thinking, well, what, what's it doing? Why is it so active? And they realized that um, it was probably linked to internal, like your daydreaming, your mind wandering. And so that became a very strong hypothesis that default mode activity was generating internal thought and mind wandering. And so in ADHD literature, you know, there is discussion about problems with default mode regulation. There's also discussion about problems with the central executive. But th and then there's another neural network called the salience network. And that seems to uh, kind of somewhat be in the middle. And if, if you're um, stimulated by something, something happens and you are stimulated and you focus on it, this is the network that kind of notices things in the environment and then kind of switches on your central executive so you can focus on things. And at the same time, it switches off your default mode, so it kind of removes the background chatter. And so normally when you focus, um, and the salience network could be triggered by anything, so you're reading, and the salience network is kind of noticing that you're trying to do something, and it switches this on, and it switches that off. And so that's the kind of normal pattern. It seems in ADHD you can't switch that off. And then also it's hard to switch that on. And the two seem to kind of happen together in ADHD. So it could be for some people with ADHD the problem is here to do with the salience network that things don't grab your attention to the same degree. So there's a difference in the how stimulating does something have to be before it grabs your attention. And that could be due to a problem in here. But I suppose the problem could also be here or it could be there. And it's probably different in different people. And um, so even if you take a child with ADHD, and these are, these are very simple sort of gimmicky things, but they actually measure um, sort of cortical function. And by focusing, um, you can activate parts of your brain and you can make the ball rise up in the air. And as soon as your mind wanders, the ball kind of drops back down again. So it's kind of quite a fun thing, but it, it just shows these are really measurable things. And um, so I'm just going to show you some of the background literature behind this. And in this study, this was the first study that showed that mind wandering was linked to default mode activity. And um, although it's a little bit complex, this slide, what they've done is they've got nine different cognitive tasks. So you're sitting in front of a computer doing some kind of task where you've got to focus. Um, but some of the tasks are easier to do, some of them are more difficult. And the basic idea is that if it's a hard task, you have to focus more and mind wander less to keep focused. If it's a very simple task, your mind can wander and you can do the task at the same time. And so by doing that, they, they then um, are asking people literally by interrupting and saying, are you focused on what are you doing or has your mind wandered off? You can measure the frequency um, of times when they're focused or unfocused. And so this here is looking at the frequency of task unrelated thoughts. How often is your mind wandering? And this is a measure of the default mode network. 
and you'll see there's a very strong relationship so the more your mind wanders the more de the um, more active your default mode is and in fact you can see how strong this relationship is I didn't put the figure oh yeah here so the correlation is about 0.9 so it's actually incredibly strong and prop one of the strongest relationships we know between anything in the brain and something you report like a subjective thing you report and then when you do kind of more sophisticated analyses that's where they sort of pick out that it's these certain brain regions and they're all involved in the default mode network and then there was another study very similar using fMRI and you're doing this boring task you have to focus on these numbers and every time a th and press a button every time a three comes up you have to withhold your number so it's really boring and your mind wanders a lot and it's quite challenging to keep focused and then you interrupt people and you say were you focused on the task or has your mind wandered off and then interestingly there are two types of your mind wanders off there your mind wanders off but you know what you were thinking about but sometimes your mind wanders off and you've even no idea what you were thinking it's like your mind's gone and you're not even aware of what you're so they call it mind wandering with awareness and mind wandering without awareness and then when they look in the brain again they can show that when your mind has wandered off you get these um, default mode regions are kind of associated with your mind wandering off um, this is a slight complexity but they also show that executive control can also be act active at the same time and this is because some people when their mind wanders they're actually focused on their internal thoughts so it's not necessarily an unfocused type of mind wandering um, and then what I found really interesting is if you contrast mind wandering uh, with awareness and mind wandering without awareness there's actually a huge difference in in the brain function and again the default mode what this is showing is again default mode regions are much more active when you mind wander without any awareness at all and they become deactivated when you become aware of your mind wandering and when you're actually focused on a task they're most deactivated so there's a kind of relationship between awareness and default mode activity so a bit like people who know when they're dreaming yeah so you're thinking like you might be driving your car thinking about something and you actually know what you're thinking about you're problem solving in your mind and you're aware of what you're thinking about that can be very different from you're driving along and you actually something your mind was nowhere and you didn't even recognize where your mind was so it was almost like a blank they, some people call it mind blanking and you get uh, there was a recent paper showing you get more mind blank in the NADHD so when their mind wanders it's often goes somewhere else and you're not you're not necessarily aware of it and it seems to relate to how active your default mode is so I mean a potential is that um, uh, I mean we don't know the answer to this but mindfulness meditation potentially is strengthening these particular neural networks and by bringing awareness to mind wandering you're actually improving your ability to focus um, that's a meta-analysis it just shows the same thing so I don't want to dwell too much on all these things because they're it gets a bit technical but you've got the deliberate type of mind wandering where you're, it's a kind of um, increased strategic thinking like driving your car, you're thinking about your dinner or your work you know it's quite useful but um, you also get this kind of executive, this sort of failed type of mind wandering where it's more like you can't suppress these unwanted thoughts and they just keep popping up in your head and they're a distraction so they're these two different types of mind wandering and so clearly we think this is linked to ADHD but a lot of the brain training programs are kind of more about improving working memory and cortical functions so if working memory or executive control is a key problem but what they showed in those studies is you can improve working memory function but it doesn't necessarily help your ADHD so it uh, or you know or it doesn't in general it doesn't and so it might be that they're not tapping into the right thing there's also the link with anxiety, isn't there? Because yeah. if you're like an exam paper, mm -hmm. you read and read and read, presumably yeah. that's, that's anxiety causing that rather than mind wandering. 
Yeah. So, so I mean, if I think if you're, yeah, that might be an example of being hijacked. Yeah. By yeah. Whereas in ADHD, it's it tends, you know, you, it's hard to, you know, it's more the boredom threshold is shifted, yeah. and so you as soon as you, you know, it's boring doing an exam. As soon as you, yeah. you lose that focus, then your mind's wandering, and then you can't focus. But there's a great example of this. So, this was a study by um, Katia Rubia. And so this is exactly what you're talking about. So this is again using fMRI. And um, this is measuring cortical function. So as you, as a task gets harder, you need to put more effort into focusing. And what they're doing here is it's, it, you're responding to a stimulus on a computer screen, but they're increasing the delay between each kind of stimulus on the screen. So if it's very quick and fast, it's easier to focus. But if you have to wait a long time, like eight seconds, you're waiting, then your mind wanders off and you can't focus. So it's harder to focus in a slow condition than a fast condition. And so in healthy people, people without ADHD, as you go from a fast condition to a slow, boring condition, you can see there's an increasing amount of um, central executive control. And this is the ADHD group. So they're, lack of, they, they're not adapting. You can think of it as they're not adapting to the demands of the task as the task gets harder. So they're okay in a simple condition, but when it gets, they have to focus harder to keep focused. And then equally, this is the default mode. So in the controls, you get this sort of stepwise reduction in the default mode. And that's the ADHD group. I mean, it almost looks as if not only can't they trigger off their central executive, but this it almost gets worse. So it might be as you get more bored, your mind just, you know, your default mode exactly sets so up. Exactly so yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So I thought this was a yeah. brilliant study, actually. Yeah. By and there was another study we, we did using EEG, but again measuring the same sort of thing. And here they're just resting, and, and then um, this is a relatively simple task, and this is a much harder task. So if you don't have ADHD, as you go from rest, and then a simple task, and then a hard task, you get this kind of increase in, in this sort of brain activity. But the horizontal line is the ADHD group. So they're, again, they're not adapting to the changing task demands. And this is before stimulant medication. So you've got that same effect, and this is after. So that ADHD group, now they're able to mm -hmm. activate. So it's altering the salience threshold. Yeah. Still at a much lower level. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, yeah, I'm not sure that may or may not be meaningful. I mean, it's a good yeah. question. But I don't know what, um, there are many things that affect the baselines. So it's, and even here it's kind of interesting because it's almost like a crossover. So at rest they seem to be, uh, the ADHD group's higher and then so it's kind of interesting. And if you measure it in the wrong condition, you may not see a difference, sort of even though there is. So one of the problems with things like Qubitest is they're only measuring one condition. But in a way, what you want to compare is um, a simple task to a hard task. Yeah. And that's where you would, you're more likely to see something to do with ADHD if you measure two conditions, a simple task and a hard task. I really wish schools yeah. could see this, because yeah. this is also all about mm. breaking down tasks, mm -hmm. which uh, certainly at my son's school, they right. make absolutely no effort to do yeah. anything different right. at all, and then ask me why he's not concentrating, yeah. even when he's on medication. Right. Yeah. And it's very, people think you're making it up still, right. even now. Yeah. And I just wish that, especially the science teachers, actually they're the worst, yeah. I wish they could see some of this. There's an expert. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's an interesting point, and I was talking to, to the artist I'm working with. We, she had this idea of writing, um, having like a, a pictorial book that tried to capture these ideas. But so your your comment on that is really interesting. I hadn't thought of that. How important that could be to get over this kind of science because it's very much about the symptoms and the actual. Yeah, that's really interesting. The other thing I learned about, I think I've learned about ADHD, but we're still investigating, is we call it sensory decoupling. So in healthy, if you compare people with ADHD, well, sorry, this is in people without ADHD, but it's comparing when you're focused on a task compared with when you're not focused on a task. And you can see that these two images look really different. 
And what's happening here is that when you're focused, as soon as the stimulus comes up on the screen, you get this very early sensory response. So this is the, the sensory cortex responding to the visual stimulus on the screen. But when your mind's wandered, you're seeing it's like a sensory deficit. There's no response. You're not seeing what's in front of your eyes. And this is sort of measured at the EEG level. Um, and, and this is over this sort of occipital cortex. So that was really striking. And then I thought, well, OK, in ADHD, they should be more often in this state than in this state. And so this is data. We're still working on it. But it does look as if that's the case. So actually, this slide has got lots of errors in it. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, yeah, this is meant to be before errors. And there's a kind of, you get a reduced activity in this sensory area and this is when you make correct responses. I'm sorry about that, there's lots of errors in this slide, but it, it, it's the first, it is suggesting that these sensory deficits, you get them in ADHD. So it's not always that they take something in and then they're processing it wrong, because that's the executive function idea. But then that may be true, but even before that, they may not even be noticing. So they're not listening, they're not seeing, because their mind is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a core sensory deficit. And of course, if something's more interesting, of course, then they become focused, mm -hmm. or they could flip into hyper-focus. But then equally, as soon as that kind of feeling goes, then they flip out of it. And they don't have the ability to kind of switch it on and off easily, like uh, many other people do. It's harder to switch on and off between these different states. I was going to ask that. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to understand from my daughter's point of view because obviously it can be frustrating as a parent, mm. but I, I need to understand more from her perspective. I mean, mm. how much control have they got with kind of behaviour and listening? Because you know, sometimes yeah. it seems you're given instruction and it'll be fine, other yeah. times you can just ask. I mean, it is a kind of a dimension. So again, you're going to go from really, like at its most severe, maybe even something that they find interesting, they can't focus on. I mean, really severe ADHD, you can't really, you know, it's so hard to focus on anything, even the things you like doing. But then again, there's lots of people that can focus, you know, like people with ADHD and they're brilliant at football. So they're focused when they're playing football. For some people it's so severe they can't even do that. So it kind of it is a dimensional trait. So it's kind of really hard to answer that and it depends what the impact is on them. So if you know if it's really intrusive and having a severe impact. But I think potentially people could train themselves to and this is why it's very important I think to um, to find out what somebody really enjoys doing and build on that. So if you look at the people with ADHD who are succeeding, normally their parents found out what they really like doing and then supported them to do that thing because they could really excel in that one area. So even if they found other sorts of tasks harder. And I mean, when I'm in my work in the prison, I have to say I see a lot of people where they weren't directed. And so then they're completely un yeah the, the, you know and all the you can almost see that their impulsive activities could have been directed to something more productive yeah so that's the challenge yeah. we're having at the moment it's fine it's yeah. because it, it will be interesting for a while and then yeah she won't like the coach or the teacher and right i mean it's hard <laughs> and and i think <laughs> school you know in general it's hard and they can try and adapt their teaching but of course it can be hard mm -hmm. And probably, the, I don't know, you know, you'd need a very stimulating environment with lots of sort of exciting things happening all the time. And, you know, it's quite hard to constantly teach in that way. Um, but I suppose it's, you know, of course, children with ADHD might excel in certain subjects, the ones they really like, but then they'll really flunk in others, mm -hmm. you know, because they're so bored with it and they can't focus. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think in the face of all of this, um, making sure that they have a positive experience of their childhood is so important because yeah. again in the prison what I noticed is they're so n they've really entrenched this negative view of themselves it's like there's no point what's the point I've given up and they're just full of negative experiences whereas if you know if they'd had a more positive experience they probably wouldn't be in prison I mean, it seems to be the very last bit of this talk was to talk specifically on the salience so I'll just show this one last piece of work. 
which was comparing the effects of methylphenidate and motivation on this default mode function. So this is another very nice study to show teachers, I'd have thought. <laughs> and this is doing um, one of these computer tasks and it's a, a boring condition. And the group with ADHD, these are children with ADHD off medication and they can't switch off their default mode. If you put them on medication or if you com compare to a non-ADHD group, then they can deactivate their default mode. But what they've done here is they've done the same task, but they've given them points and little smiley pictures and rewarded them for doing the same task. And actually, the effects of incentivizing them had the same effect on the brain as giving them methylphenidate. So they concluded, um, actually I don't have the quote, but they said that um, essentially what the medication is enabling you to do is function well, focus in a boring environment. So you could think of it that way. If you do something really stimulating they, that they want to do, they already can focus. But that doesn't necessarily give you easy solutions because, of course, many parts of daily life are not that stimulating all of the time. So it's a kind of hard thing, particularly if you're young. We know that many people with ADHD have in excessive emotional reactions, get irritable, hot temper, aggression sometimes. Um, certainly irritability, frustration, anger, these are common. And there's a, and there's a wide literature on this um, in ADHD. And in fact, then I, I met somebody, Gabrielle Carlson, and she told me that years and years ago, so these are like the pioneers of ADHD, I don't know when this was, back in the 50s, and they called ADHD Hyde, hyperactivity, impulsivity, distractibility and emotional lability. Um, so they, they always recognised it as part and parcel of ADHD. And so it, it's a bit unclear precisely why emotion dysregulation got kind of partialed out. But actually most people in the field know emotional ability or many people thought it was part of ADHD. And so there is this kind of question is where, where, where does it lie in the criteria? Um, and so you've got inattention and hyperactivity, but what about the um, emotion dysregulation. And so one of the first studies, well, the more recent studies that kind of got people thinking more about this again was from Russell Barclay. And he had a sample of children and then he followed them up until the age of 27. And then in the blue bars you've got, at the age of 27, children who still had ADHD at the age of 27. In the red bars, you've got the group who've grown out of ADHD, as some people do, and here you've got a control group. And if you ask them about their emotional symptoms, you'll see that the group who still have ADHD report a lot of emotional symptoms, like getting impatient, getting angry, easily frustrated, overreacting to things, um, easily excited, losing temper, getting easily annoyed, these kind of problems. And um, he also went, then went on and did a statistical analysis that showed, first of all, that emotion dysregulation was related to a wide range of problems in real life, and that even if you uh, remove the effects of ADHD symptoms, emotion dysregulation in itself was causing problems in daily life. So he concluded that emotional impulsivity, as he called it, is as much a component of ADHD as the two traditional dimensions. And I think that sort of conclusion has been largely borne out by other people that have looked at it. Um, so we did a study, because one of my students, Caroline Skiro, people were saying, well, it could be due to comorbidity. It's because they're anxious and they're depressed, and that's why. And so in her study, she actually collected a sample of adult men who didn't have a comorbidity. And it was a hard sample to collect. So she screened 508 men referred to the Maudsley Clinic, and she got a final sample of 41. So she really went out of her way to exclude people that had another disorder. And then she started measuring emotional symptoms, first of all using rating scales. And this essentially just shows that the group with ADHD without any other comorbidity had much higher levels of um, of uh, these mood symptoms, emotion dysregulation, that's these first two 
In fact, all of these are, are different measures of emotion dysregulation. So these were highly um, predictive of this diagnosis, even in the group without another condition. And then she did a very similar analysis to Russell Barclay, essentially just showing that even if you controlled for, in a, for the ADHD symptoms, emotion dysregulation was causing impairment in their daily life. It was a problem for them in their daily life. So we st we've um, started measuring these things using an experience sampling method. So you wear a watch and it vibrates about eight times a day. And when it vibrates, you have to... F this, this was our original study with a very old-fashioned sort of thing. And then when it, you have to fill in all these questions. And um, how do you feel now? Just right now, how are you feeling? Do you feel frustrated, it. angry or irritable? My son did this. Did he? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Was there. Moved on. Yeah, we've moved on. <laughs> that must be with uh, Celine or Poppy. 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 Brilliant. And positive moods as well. So this was the original study we did in adults. And so each row, this is what I call it a heat map of anger. And each row is um, one individual, and each little block is how angry they were feeling at a point in time. And it's done over a typical working week. So this healthy control down here was very angry, but most of the time they're, you know, they're fine. But you can see how the ADHD group look very different. They're reporting being angry much more often, but also it's more speckled, so they're going in and out of it more. And you can look at it statistically and that's basically what this shows more negative moods in particular irritable frustrated angry but this one is measuring how much they go up and down they go up and down much more and this shows that when a bad thing happens the group with ADHD overreact and it takes about two hours for them to kind of come back down whereas this is the kind of other group so um, as you s so in the literature this kind of method has also been used for other disorders and I think one of the reasons why emotion dysregulation is not a clinical criteria for ADHD is because it's not very specific to ADHD. So, of course, you do see it in other disorders. And this really showed this. And using the same methodology, they're comparing a group with borderline personality disorder, where emotion instability is kind of like a core symptom of this disorder. And then this is a, a control group. Sorry, sorry, this is the control group down here. And this is kind of how strong their emotional is, and this is how distressed they feel. But what was interesting is they did the same study in a group with post-traumatic stress disorder, and I think essentially there isn't a difference. And they also did it in people with the bulimia nervosa, and essentially there isn't a difference. So up until now, no one had done this in ADHD, but we've now done this in ADHD, and comparing borderline with ADHD. And essentially what we've found is the, it is true that the borderline group have slightly higher valence, so they have a slightly higher intensity of emotion, but they're just as unstable. So, they're, um, so their mood changes are very unstable, but it is true the borderlines are slightly more intense. It did make me wonder whether somebody with borderline could be, in some cases, a depressed person with ADHD or an ADHD person with depression could equal somebody with borderline. Mm -hmm. I mean the clinical picture of borderline, you know, about a third of people with borderline meet ADHD criteria. And um, I think this is an area that needs sort of more work on. But then would ADHD so medication help them with those other aspects? Well, no one knows. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good question then. Yeah. yeah. And I, this was the data that we, we generated using the mood mapper, the same thing you used. But it was just comparing um, ADHD and borderline and, and essentially showing what, 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 I, what I was just saying. Adults. This is in adults. Yeah. We do have it in the children. We have an, we're in the process of analysing it. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to say is that if you take measures of um, emotion dysregulation and you do clinical trials of drug treatments, um, what you find is that there is a clinically significant effect of both of mainly the stimulants who have a bigger effect on emotion regulation than um, atomoxetine. But it's, you know, there's still not enough data around to be definitive. But of course, when you treat people with ADHD, most of us know that you're calmer, more focused, but, and your mood is more stable. I and mean, it's a typical sort of outcome. So it's not 
So, of course, you do get more control and regulation over these emotional reactions and responses. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, my daughter, yeah. on the lethal felidate, has started getting very angry when she's coming down from it. Right. And my husband doesn't want to take this because mm. of what he's seen her do. Oh. Um, so it's almost like the point where it's coming off. Yes. Yeah. Um, perhaps she's just unlucky and we're now trying out. <coughs> yeah, I mean, some people, and I think kids are probably, because I don't work so much with children, but my, I work with adults, and maybe adults are less prone to that. But I think, of course, people can be very sensitive to the effects of medication, and it needs to be titrated very carefully. And, and you possibly almost, it, and it could be that, you're moving from a state where you're calm and then everything changes and so you're you know the difference is becoming pronounced as the medication comes out of the system or it could some people say that, that you can get a little bit of a rebound so because you've been on this medication when it comes out of the system for a brief period of time the symptoms might be even worse so one way of trying to get around that is to try and take a the sort of medication that has the smoothest, like the most gradual offset and most gradual offset. So probably avoiding short acting, trying to go for the longest acting. But it, it needs um, somebody with some expertise to kind of work out th the solution to that. And I think the problem is if you don't work out the solution to that, you'll, you'll eventually stop using it because it, it might cause some a problem. So I think it's a really good reason to go back to a specialist who can really advise on that. It is interesting. Yeah. You think it would be worse in children? I think they're more, they're going to be on average more sensitive, I think, to all the side effects. And, and then there's this other issue with children when they're entering the teen years that they often just don't want to be treated anyway. Mm. And that is sometimes more appropriate than, you know, sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it isn't. But. But I think there is, um, I think teenagers do have a problem with changing mental states and they want to be who they are and this medication is changing them. And um, so it's a funny, you know, it's a difficult period of life anyway. But I think these on-off effects can, can make it hard for people. So I think, again, with teenagers, I would really be wanting to talk to them. You know, I mean, you need to understand how they experience the medication and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And sort of, I mean, that's what we do with adults. And some adults take it all the time, some take it some of the time. And if you have problems like this, we really kind of work hard to sort of find a way around it. Um, and even if people choose not to take medication, okay, that, that can be fine as well. But it's good to have the kind of knowledge and understanding. Um, but you're right, I mean, these medications affect emotional symptoms as well. And usually you're calmer when you're on them, but sometimes the drugs have unexpected effects, and even though they're meant to make you more in inattentive, there's probably a, a small number of people that get worse. You know, not everyone responds as you expect. And I suppose with children, a small number of children might get more irritable. But in, generally, in general they don't, but of course sometimes they might. So you have to be really sensitive to these adverse effects. Yeah. I think I've noticed on some of the yeah. forums in the US, they seem to be incorporating a lot of genetic testing to find out what the right medication yeah, is. Yeah, it's a nice idea. Mm -hmm. I th Personally, I don't but think the, the, the evidence base is there to do that. I think um, to probably just following clinical guidelines and a trial and error process is probably just as accurate. I don't personally think it's adding anything at this point in time. But they are kind of, companies are out there, they're promoting it, but the evidence is, is really not there. Yeah. The, um, do you have any thoughts on the use of neurofeedback in the treatment of uh, ADHD? I suppose... Yeah, we mentioned it earlier, and so there are, I don't think anyone has yet really shown that it has really shown, demonstrated in, in a, in a sufficiently designed study how effective it is so but but I know there are several studies current and ongoing so I think it's it's an area of quite active research at the moment and so it's a bit of an open question um, um, but certainly yeah something that happened at a recent ADHD mm. forum with Katia Rubia who did that yeah the best level one sport for ADHD um, I'm a practitioner of that mm. Um, we get amazing results, but 
Um, Sorry, with what I missed, what you um, said. The neurocognitive training. Right, yeah. But, um, I mean, yeah. We, we do really get good feedback, and Prof. Rubia was, yeah. said it was the best level one support. We've got adults on training, too, and seeing some good... Yeah. So I think it just needs it needs more, and it's very hard to do the studies because sometimes any intervention can have value because people are being supported, and it, and it's hard to um, control for those effects. And it may be that yeah, good support is really helpful, but whether it's the specifics of the training or not is is a question. But I think, um, but there is yeah, there is more work trying to sort of really demonstrate whether how useful this is but it's I suppose it will be helpful for some people but what the mechanism is is another question you have these kind of very um, difficult outcomes as an adult and particularly in our case we're looking at prisoners and criminal behavior but often they have aggression and conduct problems emotional problems and so on but why you know why do children with ADHD why are they more likely to develop these problems later in life and I suppose people focus mainly on all kinds of potential reasons. I mean, if you're failing at school, if you're kicked out of school, because certainly in the prison population, they're nearly always failed at school and they're always kicked out of school. Um, there's the kind of people they hang out with, the peer influences. Usually, it, the people in prison come from really unstructured sometimes abusive backgrounds and of course the parents themselves often are very similar to the children very similar difficulties and problems substance abuse is usually present um, possibly sometimes to self-treat I mean we found um, you know cannabis is very often used by well 70 well I'll show you some data on that later mm. and so but a lot of people had this view that there was no point treating ADHD <coughs> because it was all the problems in childhood that caused the criminality, not the ADHD itself. So what's the point of treating the ADHD? It's not going to change anything. But recently there have been studies uh, suggesting actually if, you, uh, if people go on to treatment for ADHD, they commit less offences, there's less criminal behaviour, and they're more likely to end up in prison. And so we started doing um, clinical trials on this. And we're in the middle of a randomized controlled trial. We've randomized about 140 people, and our target is 200, so we're almost there. But this is the study we did to support our current research. And we went into a prison. Um, so these, are, these were young offenders aged between 18 to 25. And this was a prison called HMP ISIS, which is next to Belmarsh, named after the ISIS Reach, which is part of the Thames. And we screened uh, just under 2,000 young adults with ADHD. About a quarter of them screened positive for ADHD. And after a careful diagnostic assessment, we found that about 20%, just under 20%, met full criteria for ADHD. And then this group we took into treatment. So that's a, that's a lot. It's one in five, at least one in five prisoners. So it's, it's really striking. And it's one of the easiest studies I've ever done because they're all there and so many of them have ADHD. So we, we're ahead of our recruitment targets, which is apparently unheard of. And if you put them on Concerta uh, for ADHD, and this is over a five week period, you, do, you, know, you get a massive reduction in ADHD symptoms. Okay, there's no control trial, there's no control condition here, but these are really huge um, effects. And you also get reduced emotional instability. And this measure is a kind of, um, this red one that improves, is a kind of measure of um, how you think you'll react in a position where you're going to be provoked. Because a lot of them get provoked and then they get aggressive. Um, but when they're on treatment, they, they are less impulsive and they have time to stop and think before they act. And they describe that really clearly. Um, and you actually also get changes in um, prison officer reports and so this is roughly half the number of um, critical incidences reported by prison officers and you also get more positive marks as well twice as many positive marks for positive engagement in various activities um, I mean these are just looking at the effect sizes I mean the effects on ADHD symptoms are really massive mm -hmm. And so if you, we worked out that 
And if only 20% of this is due to the medication, it would be the same as uh, randomized controlled trials in general, because the effects are about 0.5 or 0.6 for ADHD. This is 2.27, I mean, it's huge. So treating ADHD, I, I thought it would all be about impulsivity and emotional regulation. And I think what, I, what I've learned is the, um, the importance of education and occupation. And for many of them, the reason why they want treatment, sometimes it's because they're impulsive and aggressive and they want to control that. But sometimes it's because they actually want to learn and they want to get back to work. And without some kind of treatment, they can't do those things. So in a way, they're equally important. And um, to me, this is the best evidence is from the prison inspectorate. And they said, and this is published in their inspection of the prisoners, that all prisoners were offered screening for ADHD through the specialist concerta trial that we were doing. Some prisoners on the trial to whom we spoke were experiencing stability of behavior for the first time in their lives. And then this is the big problem. There should be efforts to ensure the continued prescribing of medication and ongoing specialist support for prisoners started on the treatment following their release. It's, in fact, it's exactly the same problem as the transition from childhood to adulthood and the sort of lack of proper, you know, sufficient services. So the prisoners have this exact same problem. They come out and there's no proper service. Or one of them, or they come out and, um, okay, there's a two-year waiting list. And so, but meanwhile, probably the, you're asking the GP to pick up on it. So, I mean, it's, you know, you can treat them in prison, but it's really hard to support them. Is that out. then that yeah. kids that are excluded from school should also yeah. probably... Yeah, they should be screened. screened. Yeah, they should. Yeah. Yeah, they're not, are they? No, they, sh they should be. Susie Young tried that to... Prevent this, get yeah. into this. Yeah. yeah. And it's really striking. I mean, A, one thing I noticed is that no one who's, that we've worked with has currently been on medical treatment. Or if they were, it was somebody in prison had put them on it. But there was no history of recently. So some of them were diagnosed as children, and they were on it for a very short time. And of course, it's interesting to think, why didn't they continue? But sometimes it was the parents that were very much against. You know, curiously, they're happy to use their own drugs, but they're not happy to use our drugs. But sometimes it was the parents, and sometimes it was the child themselves that actually didn't like the effects at that age. And it could be because it wasn't titrated carefully or, you know, thoughtfully. So maybe they were getting side effects and other problems, whereas somebody, so it needs, you know, some attention to get the, you know, to get it right. But it's very striking how nobody on treatment ends up in prison. I was really struck by that. Yeah. And is yeah. that where the self-esteem, because that's a bit of mm. struggling to work out where it comes into ADHD. <coughs> I don't know, but I think it's it's chronic sort of failure and negative attitudes yeah, towards yeah. them. Yeah, it's experience, and also that when they try to do things, they can't do it, mm -hmm. and then they just and and the people that end up with they they often more often than not they've given up as well. They've given up really trying, and they've gone for an easy option, because mm -hmm. a lot of them are there for drug dealing, so it's a kind of easy option, but it gets but them I into trouble. I mean, at least at home, you can obviously be very positive and really build up the positive things and, you know, try and minimise the negative things um, to instil so they're feeling good about themselves. But, I, and, but yeah, if they're getting a lot of negative responses. And there was, there was uh, very interesting research showing that if you've got a... Um, where they, they kind of looked at this sort of gene-environment interaction and so... In, a, in the United States, they, they have a, a program where lots of babies are adopted on the day they're born. So it's quite a strong program going on in the US. So they, they think you know, will just move them into a positive environment on the day of birth for certain people. And so you can, you, they can measure that the child has these very early ADHD problems even when they're young infants and they're correlated with the mother's ADHD. But then if they are evoking uh, negative reactions from their parents, their adopted parents, which they often do, that, that in itself has a detrimental impact on them. So they can show that in a way you're both inheriting this propensity, but the negative reactions kind of makes the whole thing worse. So, so schools do need to have a better understanding of what ADHD is. Because I guess if they're understanding it, they're not going to be so negative. Mm. What, what percentage of children would you say would outgrow it into adulthood? 
Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. It's to some extent a little unclear in the literature. Um, there was a very f um, the paper that's often cited is a meta-analysis of children with ADHD. They were mainly from the United States. And then by the age of 25, about 15% still met full criteria. So it sort of seems like a relatively low number, but about 15%. But then there was another 50%. So they had, they were sort of sub-threshold, but it was still like their traits still causing a problem. So they'd kind of in a way partially, so about, you know, yeah. But in another study we did, and there's a very similar study in Holland, which is perhaps relevant to the UK environment, was children selected as having combined type ADHD. And I mean, this was from seven right up to 17. But um, then if you follow them forwards about six years, we found that 80% of them still had ADHD. So it might depend a little bit on the starting point, but I think the more severe the ADHD, the more likely it is to persist. Um, and also the older you are. If you have a severe ADHD and, and you're still older, of course, then it's more likely to persist. But it is quite variable. But also, even if you've got ADHD, the actual outcomes are really variable. So I think there's, of course, one should never be negative because there are so many, you know, if you, you can get it right as well, even if it doesn't, you don't grow out of it. Yeah. And there's a new, I don't know if you've come across it, there's a new literature suggesting that ADHD can actually emerge and get worse during adolescence. So there seems to be groups of children who perhaps have some symptoms or some traits, but then when they, you know, from about 12 onwards, they could match up with going into secondary school, that ADHD actually seems to get worse. And actually there's, there's an increasing amount of evidence behind that. Whereas traditionally they always thought, you know, you'd have it, like in autism, you'd have it as a very young child. But it seems as if it can, it, it can also sort of emerge somewhere between about 12 and 16. It could be that our secondary school system is actually designed to make it worse, because that's well, you, well, it feels. could be. <laughs> Executive functioning issues, I think, yeah, well, of course. Yeah, yeah, they're being much more challenged, yeah. of course. Yeah. And that, yeah. yeah maybe. Mm -hmm. Sure. And in a way, the, the symptoms aren't entirely independent of function. I mean, they're meant to be independent, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of why I like thinking more about measuring something like mind wandering, which is kind of more independent of your function. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, in a way, it probably rep represents the disorder better. And then, of course, there's your function and so on. Which is, which can vary, has there's more ability to make that vary. Yeah, a big part of the explanation is this kind of later emerging ADHD, and people used to think it was me almost entirely accounted for by people with good scaffolding. So if you're in a well-supported environment, good school, good parenting, and so on, and, and then also if you yourself had a high IQ that you would sort of manage it better and it would probably it wouldn't be until you got to university for example it really became a problem but that only seems to be one group and it does seem that there is also a truly emerging type of ADHD mm. so it's still kind of controversial and people will have different opinions on it mm. um, and I think it makes sense in the sense that some of the brain functions I've been talking about actually continue to develop during the adolescent years. So it might be that the difference between you and somebody else actually increases if those parts of the brain, like your executive control functions, aren't developing at that age. Mm. So it, it does make sense, but it's quite controversial still. Okay. I'm thinking about my son. Sometimes, mm. if you ask him a question about something that interests him, he'll suddenly come out with this incredibly mm. cogent, yeah. kind of insightful mm. thought, and I'm like, amazed at where that came from obviously it's very unpredictable yeah but i just wonder if you had any experience yeah no definitely and 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 i mean it's interesting how people experience and manage mind this mind wandering in very different ways and some people really seem to suffer with it and other people really like it yeah. Yeah. some people like it but they still can't function because of it and so they're happy to take medication when they need it but most of the time they don't want it. But some people, uh, like the artist I'm working with, has ADHD, she's not on medication, she's not really interested in that, and she's learnt how to kind of um, be very productive and chase these ideas, and, she, and that keeps her focused. But she's very, it's almost like super energetic, and 
It's even like a prisoner I met. He said, I'm a real, he's a, he's a builder when he's, and, and um, he said, I'm a real grafter. I mean, he'll go in, he'll work really hard. So he's great at his job. Um, but he gets very, um, um, he gets, he's quite volatile. And so his crimes were all getting aggressive when he was provoked and he couldn't control that. And if you met him, he's like, he, he said he'd taken cocaine, but he said most people think I'm on cocaine all the time because he's like <laughs> constant, you know, it's like, Ugh. but he's really severe. You can see really severe ADHD. And the, and the problem isn't in his work because he's found work that works for him. Mm. You know, probably his lifestyle is pretty chaotic, but he doesn't mind that. He seems to quite like it, but then, it, but then his crime is he can't control his aggression. Mm.